I'd like to welcome everyone to our virtual presentation of the York Sunbury Historical Society speaker series with the Honorable Braden Nicholas speaking on the rightful place of Indigenous veterans. To start, I'm going to ask Hal Stara, the president of the York Sunbury Historical Society, to uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you so very much, Ruth. It is my extreme honor to introduce the Honorable Graydon Nicholas, Order of New Brunswick, was the 30th Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick from 2009 to 2014, becoming the first Aboriginal person to hold this office. I had the privilege of being there that day, sir, and the emotion that was hanging in that room was palpable, you could feel it. My Sergeant Charles Paul, as you were going forward to receive the honor, couldn't help himself. He had to run up and embrace you. He was just so proud of you in that moment. The entire audience was just really full of, we are proud to have you as our Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, it was an extraordinary day. Uh, and especially from a person coming from Tobique, my family's from up around the New Denmark way, kind or so uh, neighbors. Well, this incredibly distinguished person was born on the Tobique Preserve, 1946 earned a Bachelor of Science degree from St. Francis Xavier University in 1968, a law degree from UNB Law School in 1971, and a Master of Social Work degree from Wilfrid Laurier in 1974. He's received four, four honorary degrees from St. Francis Xavier University in 1994, um, WLU, Wilfrid Laurier, I believe, in 2002, Mount Allison University, 2010, and UNB in 2015. He was a provincial court judge from 1991 to 2009, and I have heard one of the most fair that we've ever had. He was a chair of Native Studies at St. Thomas University from 89 to 91, and he worked with the Union of New Brunswick Indians as legal counsel, chairman of the board, and president of the Union of New Brunswick Indians from 1974 to 1988. He was appointed to the endowed chair of Native Studies on the 1st of August, 2015 for a year term, and reappointed again in 2021 involved with teaching, research, and community interaction. He's a recipient of the Order of Canada on May 2016, appointed the Guadalupe Circle of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops in December 2016 to represent the Knights of Columbus. He's an independent member of the General Insurance Ombud Service for a three-year term in October 2017. And again, that was renewed. As I say, the thing that I was most proud to hear is he was appointed the honorary colonel for three field regiments, the Loyal, on the 20th of June, 2019. Many long years ago, I was their adjutant with the 89th up in Woodstock. And my own experience is to be chosen as an honorary, is an honor way beyond what people imagine. It's not a technical thing, it's being chosen because of who you are and what you represent. He was installed as the Chancellor of St. Thomas University on the 11th of May, 2021, for a term of four years. You're going to have to be 100 to complete this. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Graydon Nicholas. Oh, thank you very much. Hell, I was holding my breath. I said, how many more is going to come out of that CV? But uh, it, actually, it's a great honor to be asked to come and share with you. I want to thank, in particular, of course, Charles Ferris, who was after me, after me, and all these other things I was doing. And finally, we connected, and finally, we had agreed on date, had to be adjourned. Another date had to be agreed. Until now, on this day of December, we're having an opportunity to share uh, some of my, I guess, uh, deep, uh, deep convictions about Indigenous veterans. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so I will share from that, of course, PowerPoint, and I was assist, assisted by my good friend, Terry Kelly, who's actually a, a technician, a very good technician at St. Thomas University. But it's wonderful to see all of you, the ones that I know. Of course, I see my cousin there, Joanna, who was just uh, elected as the regional chief for, for the Assembly of First Nation, the first woman to do that. And of course, I, see, I do see the honorary colonel, uh, Cheryl and Jeff as well, and uh, others on this thing. And I, I do also want to acknowledge Harold, Harold Wright, who has been, uh, who got me involved in a project that's still ongoing at St. Thomas University now. So, and there's a lot of you out there. I, you know, too bad it wasn't in person. Uh, I could shake your hand and say, 
thank you for coming. And uh, I hope you're not disappointed in, in the in the particular presentation that we're going to give here. So this particular uh, that you have, this is a remarkable individual that will be explained a little bit better, a highly decorated person. And I thought the theme for me to find the rightful place of Canadian Indigenous veterans in our country because of all that they had to offer. So the next slide, please. And this just gives you a little bit of background. Because I'm from St. Thomas University, I've got to give this little blip in there as well, you know, so just to acknowledge that I'm there. Okay, thank you very much. Next one, I guess. Uh, and uh, I guess my colleagues who are honorary colonels will look at this and see the particular, uh, this course was taken on uh, November 11th uh, on one of the years. And you'll see in the background, this is in my little uh, porch that we have in our home, all dressed up. And actually they found the uniform small enough for me to get into. And <laughs> in the back is uh, Our Lady Guadalupe that my wife and I are dearly dedicated to. So thank you very much for the next slide, please. And here we're going to get into the New Brunswick Indigenous veteran story a little bit. And as you can see from this particular slide, and these some of these slides that are coming up are actually uh, slides that I asked Harold if we could borrow them for part of this presentation because they're doing wonderful work uh, at St. Thomas University. And as you can see there, there were over 400 Indigenous veterans from New Brunswick who served in World War I and to the, right to the Korean conflict. This particular person, Private Peter Barlow, he was a chief later on of Indian Island and was getting involved in indigenous politics back in the 70s and 80s. Believe me, this was a great ally and I had great respect for him. And he was chief of his community for almost 35 years until he decided to have an election and they elected his opponent. But he had no regrets. He was a great guy and a wonderful man. Thank you very much. Next, next video. And of course, this is a particular project that Harold, uh, of course, Chief Terry Richards, Rich, Richardson, and also one of the students at, at uh, St. Thomas, Tanya Bourgeois. They are involved in this particular important, actually, uh, uh, event in which they're trying to locate as many of the indigenous graves and put the markers. And of course, you can see where some of their funding comes from as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we all know of this uh, particular initiative, which is very good. And I, it's long overdue, and I'm glad they're doing it. Thank you. Next one. And these two particular individuals, I had to pick two people in this presentation as to who I could share because I knew both of them. And on the left here is um, Oliver Pulchis, and on the right is uh, Elder uh, Labilawa, Margaret Labilawa, who was chief of the well, the next slide will come explain it a little bit more. Okay. Now, Oliver, he was a private when he was with the Carlton and York Regiment. And after he was owned it, he returned to Canada. And then later, actually, when I first got to meet him, he was the chief of Woodstock First Nation. And he was a very, a very determined man and, and wanted to improve the lives of his own people. Uh, and so he, he was good. He was good. He was kind to me in a way. You know, he could he, he kind of uh, told me a little bit about the political ropes, but I enjoyed his company as well. And the next one here, um, Margaret Labilova. As you know, at the time when she joined the Air Force, there was this policy in the Canadian Air Force, which did not want the Indigenous people. All they wanted were British subjects to be part of the Air Force. But she got in there and she was actually a, a, pho a photo technician. And she was kind of monitoring what was happening on the West Coast around Alaska, just in case the, the Japanese decided to come in through from that area to Alaska and down to the United States. So she, and then later on, uh, she's a beautiful woman. She died, unfortunately, but she uh, was chief of the Eel River Bar First Nation, Megamo woman and very strong leader, very, very strong, very intelligent. And she was probably in her late 40s when she attended university up in Ontario, so that in fact, she could be an instructor of the uh, Mi'kmaq language because she was very great about that. And of course, she recipient of the Order of New Brunswick. And, and she was probably the first chief in the province here when I returned back in 74 to ask me as a young lawyer to become involved with their land claim up in the Yellow River Bar. And so I always had great respect for her because she had confidence in me. But, and together, I think we were able to achieve a result that was satisfactory to our community. Next, please. 
And of course, again, from this particular project that Harold Nutters are involved in, you can see then these particular uh, First Nation communities in our province for the Mi'kmaq and the Wallistic Week as well, and the different regions that they come from. And you can see the number of uh, veterans that were involved in each of these areas and trying to locate all the particular cemeteries there were. So, okay, to the next video then. Uh, this will this will just indicate to you the particular map of the of the 15 first 16 first nation communities actually who were involved in in the war effort i call it both in world war 1 and the second war and also in korea and they came from all over so this gives you an indication of in our province where they came from and uh, primarily on the eastern coast is the Megamo, the Willistagweek, my tribe along St. John River, and you've got the Passamaquoddy near St. Croix. And uh, okay, thank you very much. Next one. And this particular person, uh, Private Patrick Joseph Augustine, he was, I knew, I know his son, Patrick. And so this was an opportunity to acknowledge that his father was involved in the Black Watch. And that he had at the time, of course, this is after the war, but he was involved in the, the brigade, NATO brigade in Germany in the 60s. So unfortunately, he, he has died, but uh, that's a good picture of him. Okay, thank you. And then now, just to go toward the national scene now, you can see then the Canadian Indigenous Veterans Stories is what uh, we decided actually to. to target this portion. And you can see just a representative number of, uh, of, of military people who are involved there. In the center, of course, is a non-Indigenous guy. But uh, so we'll go down to the next one then. And I just wanted to focus in at least on these three amazing, amazing men. And you can see the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit volunteers who fought for their homeland and also for the country. And so we'll focus on each one of these now to give you a bit more background of them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so Francis Pegawamago. Now they call nicknamed him Peggy, and that's what he wanted to be called himself. And as Hal said, this was one of the most highly decorated individuals. He was a sniper, and he uh, he was, as you can see, he was Nish well Ojibwe. They say there, but it's actually Nishinaabe now that they call Perry Island Band in Ontario. He was awarded many, many medals, believe me, for his bravery in Belgium and France. And you can see that he was given these particular um, medals and, and uh, also the uh, bars. And, uh, but he was one of the 39 members of the Canadian Expeditionary Force who received two bars in addition to that military medal. And the late, this is his view as a soldier. And then the second one is when he was in civilian life. And we'll get, learn a little bit more history about him later. Okay, thank you. And this is the beautiful statue that they created for him. You can, you can see that he's got, uh, I think it's a moose uh, on, on him where he's near his, near his home community of Perry, Perry. Okay, thank you very much. We'll go to the next one then. Uh, and of course, you know, this was one of the tragic stories of veterans and and his story is not unique. It happened to a lot of them. But you know, when he came back to Canada, he's when I mean he was a very brave man, highly decorated, but it didn't mean very much, unfortunately, for that particular veteran, because he never received the same rights or benefits that his comrades in arms who are non-Indigenous received. And this is just a this is just a quote. They'd gone from being a soldier to just an Indian again. And it's sad to make that commentary, but that's what happened to him right after World War II. Okay, thank you. Tommy Prince. Tommy Prince is Brooklyn Head an Ojibwe nation in Manitoba. And, and Tommy Prince was one of those actually students who had gone to residential school. And so when he got out of the residential school, he decided to do something. And then of course he joined the, the Canadian military. And he was, uh, I learned about him actually from his nephew who first, when, when I was involved in indigenous politics back in, the, back in the 70s, he said, have you heard about my uncle? I said, well, who is he? And of course I hadn't heard of him, but I said, I want to find out, look who this guy is. 
But you can see then he was one of the very, I think there were two Canadians who were selected to serve in the special forces called the Devil's Brigade. But he was a legendary sniper again and also awarded many medals. And he also decided to serve in the Korean War. So the next uh, slide. And then this is the one on top is where he's actually on mission. And the one in the bottom is when he and his brother received, uh, received medals at uh, Buckingham Palace, where it was King George VI who decorated him. And he, and he was also acknowledged by the President of the United States uh, having a silver bar. And he was, as I said, he was one of 59 Canadians awarded the Silver Star during the Second World War. And only three of this group ever possessed a military medal. Thank you. And again, you see him, this is, this is the particular force he belonged to, that, that amazing uh, uh, Devil's Brigade or that particular expedition. But you know, when he came back home, and this is the saddest part of it, you know, as it says there, he ended up living in shelters and on the streets in Winnipeg. And eventually he died in 1977. Now, not too many people, even in the military community, know of his heroism, this, this, this guy. It's fantastic. But so I, I thought I would share part of his story in this presentation tonight. Okay, thank you. Next one. Now, you know, we've heard of the cool talkers in the United States, the, the Navajo and uh, another tribe in actually Oklahoma. The ones in Oklahoma were involved in World War I and the ones the Navajos in World War II in the United States and the Pacific. But we also had coup doctors in Canada and these happened to be Cree. And you can see the ones that are here. So again, not much is known about them, uh, but we'll, I'll give you a little bit more information about them as this presentation continues. Okay, thank you. Quite a guy, Charlie Tompkins, uh, you know, uh, they were acknowledged as being the ones who were credited with helping the allies win the war in Europe. The Germans could not break that code that you'll see a little bit later, but he was known as Checker. He was a Métis and he from Grand Prairie and he died actually on August 20th, 2003 in Calgary. But he was the mo most famous Canadian code docker. And as, as, as his nickname he had was Checker and he served as a soldier in the Canadian army and also a code talker in the United States Air Force for two years during the war. So he helped translate these secret military messages from English into the Cree language. And uh, this, of course, mesmerized the Germans because they didn't know what he was saying. <laughs> they didn't know the transmission of uh, communication that went on. But you can see a young looking guy here, and, uh, but he was marvelous, and as well as were the other ones as well. But okay, next slide then, a little bit. So you'll see then part of this code. See this thing on the very top is what they call Cree syllabics. And so this was their traditional way of how in fact they would communicate with one another. And then you can see how the word is broken down in terms of what we would now use, I guess, almost the alphabet that we know now. And then again, just this little phrase in the bottom. But so it was translated then into Cree and then before it was read out loud, and then it was communicated to somebody at the other's end. So they can in fact inform the military uh, as to what their particular tactics would be. Okay, the next one. And, and you can see they had to, and this was him on top as young and later on when he was older with all these medals. And he was sworn into secrecy. And you can see then they didn't have the words for tank or machine gun. So they had to make up words. Same thing that the Navajo did actually, but you can see what they had to do to describe the particular planes that were being used. And he was so, it, this was so secret. He never, he could never tell his family. And it was only until he was 85 in an interview that he was allowed to then share what he did. And you can see these are his two brothers, Smokey and James Tompkins. And even they didn't know what their brother did. That's just how secretive this thing was. But I think, as I said, you know, this, is, uh, this was a part of a military effort and the contribution that these particular indigenous veterans played. Okay, thank you. 
So now what you see in front of you is this National Indigenous Veterans Day. And probably I'm not sure how many would be no, but this is celebrated on November the 8th of each year. And why November 8th and not celebrate on November 11th? Sadly, uh, the Indigenous veterans were not welcome at the National Cenotaph in Ottawa. For whatever reason, they decided they never were invited and they never were part of that. So since 19, well, since 1984, they decided to say, okay, we want to be, we want to recognize our own people. My older brother, Dennis, who was, was, who was with chief of our community one time and later on was vice president with the NIB before he changed to AFN. He was one of the organizers who helped set up this national indigenous veterans organization. But they selected November 8th specifically because they, they said there's gotta be a day in which uh, the public and our indigenous communities could celebrate the efforts of, our, of one of our own. So that's why and this beautiful monument, you'll see it a little bit later again, is actually in, in, in Ottawa. I'll explain a little bit how it was unveiled. Okay, thank you. So there you go. This was in, and the, the one who designed this actually, it was a son of a veteran who was given very little, very little acknowledgement. So you can see that the description reads, many thousands of Aboriginal people saw action and endured hardship in the first, second world wars and the Korean war. They served with honor and distinction in all branches of the service in every rank and appointment from private to brigadier. They fought overseas to defend the sovereignty and liberty of allied nations. In addition to supporting the cause at home, their dedication continues in peacekeeping operations in faraway lands. And if you're ever in Ottawa, I would encourage you to go see this because this is a four-sided uh, monument. And uh, so the next slide, please. And you can see then who created this. You can see that the artist uh, Noel Pinier did this and the four symbols that are, that are important to indigenous culture. The four is prominent in the statue, which represents four seasons. There's four sides, four directions, and four stages of life. And also four animal spirits are captured in the monument, the bear, wolf, buffalo, and elk, representing traditional indigenous animal spirits. Okay, the next one, please. And you can see the close-up of it. And naturally, there are four women and two women and two men represented in this particular monument as well. Okay, thank you very much. And I just want to have to localize this because as you can see, this particular monument is located on our reserve in, in our community, Tuvik First Nation. And these were the veterans from my community who went to World War II and were killed. And you can see that the last name on that list is Sanford S. Solis, private. He was killed in uh, August 1945 in Netherlands. Well, Holland, it was called back then, but you can see the other ones. He's my uncle. He was my uncle. He died. And in 1967, I had the opportunity to actually go visit his grave in the uh, Canadian uh, cemetery in Netherlands as well. And actually, my, this was my mother's only brother, uh, you know, before their mom died. Uh, but she had a lot of stepbrothers as well. But... Um, and I was named after him. One of the names I've got is actually him. So I just wanted to put that in there to give honor to what he did. And I still have his medals. My mother gave the medals to me uh, to keep. And so I've got them. Uh, sometimes I'll have to make a display of these as well. So again, the next one. And I thought I would refer to a couple of reports to you because, you know, these concerns that Indigenous veterans across Canada uh, have been bringing up, it's, they haven't been silent. And as you'll see some of these, and this particular document, there was the Senate of Canada did a hearing and released it in March of 1995 called The Aboriginal Soldier After the Wars. And there was a series of uh, evidence that was for witnesses came in. And on the very, very bottom there where you see the deputy chair, it's, uh, I can't see that with that chat thing, so I can remove it. Uh, the, uh, his name is Honorable Len Marchand. And Len Marchand was originally from uh, British Columbia. And he was, I knew him, he was in the Trudeau government actually back in the, back in the late 68 and 90s. And uh, he's indigenous from, and when he got appointed to the Senate, 
he was one of the ones who are very instrumental to be approached by indigenous veterans that they should have a hearing so that the testimony of all these veterans who had concerns who were denied rights and would be recorded and it was. So this is the particular report in 95. And I just wanna make reference to a few of the recommendations. Uh, okay, next one, please. And so you can see number one recommendation that the government of Canada on behalf of the Canadian public recognize the special contribution of Aboriginal veterans during the first and second world wars and the Korean war and apologize to Aboriginal veterans for inequities in sensitive treatments they experienced after their return from these wars. Okay, number two, that the Royal Canadian Legion continue to ensure a formal role for Aboriginal veterans at National Remembrance Day ceremonies. You know, for a while, the, the, even the Legion would not welcome Indigenous veterans in ceremonies. And it, again, this is very sad, sad part of our, now it's better, but back then this was caused, I mean, there, it's, it's sad what happened really. And then they're saying that in fact, the, they should provide resources annually and be represented annually. You can see where it says to be represented annually at the ceremony is not one remembers day. And now of course that does happen, but you can see then how in this recommendation, this had to be done. It, it's not a matter of embarrassing the country. It's a matter of bringing forth a point that's there so that there be greater respect. And the other thing that they said, well, we have to invite these indigenous veterans also in these commemorative ceremonies that take place not only in Canada, but abroad. And sure enough, both the veterans in Canada now include, well, the surviving veterans or sometimes their families to go at these particular uh, commemorative events that take place in Europe. Okay, number, well, one more, number three. And again, this is saying pilgrimages abroad, just in addition to that, and that there should be a fair representation uh, of all the, uh, you know, it's never been really determined, but they say altogether maybe 14,000 veterans served in these, in these wars and conflicts. Okay, well, thank you very much. The next particular uh, document, now this is a little a bit more relative, I mean, a bit, not that long ago. Again, indigenous veterans, from memories of injustice to lasting recognition. And this was again, a committee report, Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs. And again, there were a series of hearings that took place. Many things were brought up, especially dealing with the Inu and the Métis and uh, released on February, 2019. And uh, again, just a little bit of material that was associated with this, I'm gonna share them with you. Okay, next please. No, there's a little bit of chapter here saying between the wars. And here is one of those unfortunately and sad things that had happened in our country. After they referred to civilian life in 1918, First Nations veterans did not enjoy the same benefits as other Canadian veterans. The Canadian government's view was that as status Indians, they were already receiving government support not available to other Canadians and that it would be unfair for them to receive the additional support provided to other veterans. You can see how this very colonial and uh, paternalistic mentality that the federal government had in relation to people who had made sacrifices to be over there. All right, the next uh, particular quotation. And again, here we go. This meant that First Nation veterans were not eligible for farmland made available under an act to assist returned vet soldiers in settling upon land. Of course, this legislation was called Soldier Settlement Act, which in fact was enacted on August 29, 1917. And then emerged, and then there were, of course, amendments to, in 1919. Not only were indigenous veterans unable to acquire land under the act, but also in order to make available to other veterans, the federal government, according to various estimates, acquired between 35,000 and 75,000 hectares of Indian lands to, to in fact reward the, the non-Indigenous veterans. In reaction to this injustice, this particular one veteran, Lieutenant Frederick Ogilvy Loft, a Mohawk from the Six Nations Reserve in Grand River near Hamilton, founded League of Nations for Canada and one of the very first political movements in Canada as well. But it, it, it's, you know, it's shocking when you read this, it makes you wonder what they were thinking 
after all the contributions that they made. But these reports are good in the sense it reminds our psyche of the struggle that was there. Okay, the next one, that please. But to the credit of the Honorable Reg uh, Peck Tagen, as a result of the, of the comments that were made, as the Minister of Veterans Affairs, he agreed that the government of Canada on compassionate grounds, now this is interesting on compassionate grounds, not on the basis of right, but on compassionate grounds, say, okay, we will in fact compensate the indigenous veterans who are still alive to the tune of 39 million, which amounted to $20,000, either to the veteran or their spouse. But you know, a lot of the veterans by then had died and their widows had also died. So th that was it. And, uh, and then of course, it, like I say, it didn't include at the time the Inuit, nor the Inuit, nor the, you know, nor the Métis. There, there was separate later on. Anyway, so thank you very much. Next one, I guess, please. I am honored to be speaking to you today from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, as Canada's Minister of National Defence. In 1994, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canadians observed the first Aboriginal Veterans Day, as it was then known, to honour First Nations, Inuit, and Métis veterans. At that time, Indigenous veterans were not recognized at official Remembrance Day ceremonies. Indeed, they were excluded from laying wreaths at the National War Memorial, and their military contributions were often overlooked. Now, every year on November 8th, Canadians across the country pause to mark National Indigenous Veterans Day. We pay tribute to the many Indigenous volunteers who raised their hands to fight for freedom and human rights, which they themselves were often denied. We know of nearly 15,000 Indigenous people who served Canada in the First and Second World Wars alone. We've heard stories of whole families serving and even of multiple generations enlisting. Their reasons for service were as diverse as the rich cultures and communities that they came from. Some joined to defend their country. Others joined to reclaim their warrior heritage. And many joined to escape colonial constraints that persist in many forms to this day. They all deserve to be treated with the same dignity, respect and appreciation that Canada afforded their non-Indigenous comrades. But instead, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis veterans returned home to a country that refused their benefits, seized their land, stripped them of their status, and denied their right to vote. Today, more and more Canadians are learning about Indigenous veteran service, sacrifice, and resilience. We all have a duty to tell their stories and pass them on to the next generation. Earlier this year, Canada's first Indigenous Governor General, Mary Simon, marked the 20th anniversary of the National Aboriginal Veterans Monument in Ottawa. She noted that throughout history, Indigenous veterans have bravely served on land, sea, and in the air, alongside allies, believing that they could make a difference. Indeed, they have done so throughout Canada's military history. The Gagnon brothers from Kitakan Zibi fought in the Battle of the Somme. Saskatchewan Métis paratrooper Noel Joseph Pinay served heroically in the Second World War, and his service inspired his son to design the National Aboriginal Veterans Monument. And today, we can look to leaders like Petty Officer First Class Katrina Stewart from Nishka Nation in British Columbia, who began her Navy career nearly two decades ago. Her vast experience includes deployments around the world and work with new Indigenous recruits to the military through the CAF's Aboriginal Entry and Summer Youth programs. Now, she co-chairs the Regional Defence Aboriginal Advisory Group and serves as a senior demolition instructor. 
Her story is one of thousands, and today is an occasion to tell those stories. To the many Indigenous veterans of our Canadian Armed Forces, you have made enormous sacrifices for our freedom and our security, and you have helped build a more peaceful and prosperous world. We thank you today and every day, lest we forget. Thank you very much. That's a really good video. And uh, so uh, I guess we'll go on to the next slide now. And I thought we would we could read this together. It's in my language as well, but I'm, I'm not fluent in my language. I can speak it, but I can't write or read it. So maybe together, uh, I'll read it out in the English portion, and then you can read along with me as well. They shall not grow old as we that are left behind grow old. A shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them forever. And this was translated by uh, Imelda Purley, who, of course, her name is Oblomsa West. Uh, she did that in 2012. And this is usually read at the on the National Indigenous Veterans Day at St. Mary's First Nation on November 8th of each year. So uh, again, to the next next one, I guess, uh, next slide. And this is just uh, before getting the Q&A, this particular poppy is, is beaded. It was given to me uh, when I was left in a governor in the province of New Brunswick. It's a beautiful way of bringing again indigenous, uh, indigenous identity into our forces. And you can see the design that's there, the, the arrows that are air, pointing toward the center and so um anyway i want to thank each and each and every one of you very very much we do have a question um from evelyn did more indigenous veterans serve in the army air force or navy I think there were probably more in the actual army, the infantry, than the different uh, different uh, parts of the military at the time. And there were some in the Air Force as well, and there were some in the Navy. Uh, but I'd say it was more in the army area. And uh, actually, there were also a lot of Indigenous veterans in the United States uh, that joined the military over there, usually the Marines or the Army. But uh, but I'd say the Army was the primary beneficiary of a lot of the Indigenous veterans. We have a question from Melinda. I heard from some of the veterans in Perth Andover that Charlie Paul was not allowed to go to the Legion after the war and was therefore excluded from learning about the many benefits available to veterans. Did he ever tell you about that? Uh, yes, he did. He was, he was uh, very upset and annoyed. He, and, uh, he, Charles, he's, he's my cousin, and he, he, he brought home a war bride uh, and from England, a fantastic woman. She, she learned Malsi so well, she could speak it as good as anybody else in our community at the time. But yeah, the downtown legion in Perth, and Perth did not welcome him at all. For uh, I think you have to remember there was quite a bit of racism in certain areas of this province. And the information that the veterans needed was transferred from the from the military over to the local Indian agent, and local Indian agent, believe me, a lot of them uh, did not help our people very well. And he's only one of many. And uh, I'll just give another example because uh, this is a good question. The thing is, there was this, for example, this widow who survived. Uh, her husband had been killed in World War II. and and his uh, Mi'kmaq, and so they contacted. They said, well. Should we send her the money, you know, what, what she's entitled to, or should we send it to the priest? Because maybe the priest we can trust, but her we can't. Now, did that happen in non-Indigenous communities? Of course not. The, the money went directly to the family. And then there were restrictions also that were given even when the money would be turned over to the Indian agent. And uh, so, believe me, there was a lot of injustice. And if you look at that first document I, uh, that I shared, and it's available online. You should read that and you'll see even more and further injustices that were uh, brought forth by indigenous veterans in 1995. 
And uh, it's sad. It's a terrible part of our history. A lot of, strangely enough, you know, a lot of the indigenous veterans who weren't weren't there were actually residential school survivors. Well, of course, we know a little bit of history of residential school. But while they were in the military, they were like everybody else. The minute they walked out, you're an Indian. And that, unfortunately, was a very derogatory term. And uh, yeah, Charlie never forgot that. And it was only later when he came to Fredericton in the 1970s that he became more active, got friendly, and it was actually going to go to the Legion there. But it took some of his friends to say, OK, Charlie, you have the right to be here. And just you're like everybody else. So if his friends, non-Indigenous friends who were members of Legion did not come to bat, he never would have been taken in. But he's, he's only one of many, many stories. Are you aware of any New Brunswick veterans who served in the Vietnam War? Yes. Oh, yeah. We have them up in Tobik. And we also have them in uh, Elsie Buktuk and a few other uh, and a few other indigenous. Uh, uh, yeah, because I had what I, had, I think I had three who were involved in the Vietnam War. They joined actually the American military because at the time they were drawn to the Marines. The Marines have an interesting uh, relationship with Native Americans. And so because we we're close to the American border uh, up in Presque Isle and Caribou and down in the Perth Andover way, many of them went to join the Marines. And, uh, and uh, to my knowledge, no one from our community died in the Vietnam War. It's when they came back, they had problems with PTSD because of Agent Orange. And uh, it took a long time for, for the Americans to agree to compensate them for that. But uh, but yeah, that had devastating consequences. Uh, but I'm sure that, it, like for example, like in uh, Kingsclear First Nation, as well as in uh, I think Elsie Buktuk, many of them went to join the American uh, military. Also from Evelyn, how many of the recommendations in the first document were honored? Well, <laughs> you can see that. Uh, because the, the when they first started celebrating uh, the National Aboriginal Day in 1984, it was only a year after that this recommendation comes in the report that there should be some kind of recognition. And even then it was, believe me, it was what they call uh, tough sledding. And because it shocked a lot of people at the time when they came to testify and uh, it, it, I, I, uh, what can you say, you know, it's sad, it's terrible what happened after World War, after World War One, as well as World War Two, when veterans were being denied benefits and, and so when you don't have uh, citizenship as a Canadian, I, who's going to listen to you when you don't have voting rights until 1960, what pills, what politicians going to come knocking on your doors before then, hey, I want your vote. And who would you talk to? You see, there was that kind of an atmosphere, that environment that existed in Canada at the time. Since 1960, the political parties have been a bit more, not completely, but a bit more open to listening to Indigenous voices, not necessarily implementing all of them. But I just wanted to particular look at these three. And as you can see, the, some of the recommendations about compensation it was only in 2001 that finally uh, Veterans Affairs Minister says, yeah, maybe we should provide him some money. And can you believe they called it compassionate as opposed to what was rightfully theirs? I mean, even the words that they use is it's it's terrible. It's sad. But because they waited so long to implement this, you know, if the veterans are dead, the widows are dead or the widowers are dead. What are you going to do? You see, that's that's that is. I mean, it should have gone at least to the families in some way uh, to see if they could be beneficiaries. But sometimes the wheels of government moves very very slow, especially when it comes to money. <laughs> so another question from Evelyn: Were more Indigenous veterans conscripted or volunteers? Volunteered. Volunteers. You know, there's a lot of conscription history. Well, there's a bit, well, because there were a couple of treaty provisions out West, which said they would not fight in wars. And, you know, the ones in the Maritimes were called peace and friendship treaties, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, when you read your land acknowledgement, uh, heaven, but I know you as wrote, actually, the first <laughs> peace and friendship treaty was actually signed in Boston in 1725. 
And that particular document was brought to Nova Scotia in 1726. So more of the tribes could actually be part of that. But from the very beginning in 1725, uh, the Wallistic Week, the Penobscot's password parties were there. And so it, uh, I, I don't want to give too much credit to Boston, but at that time they were all colonies of British anyway. But even into his peace and friendship treaties, it's uh, the government is still litigating this stuff in court. He says, well, that was not the intent. That was not the intent. Well, jump and all jump and our people couldn't even read English. And when you look at the original signatures that are put on these particular treaty documents, and if anybody's interested, I can send it to you. It depicts a particular clan, in other words, an animal, because they couldn't speak English, they couldn't speak French, they couldn't read, and so they had to depend on the interpreters that the government would have. So this is where even now there's confusion as to what they are in these particular documents. But um, anyway, it's, it's unfortunate again what happened, it's there. Uh, but amazingly, amazingly, there were in terms of a percentages of a particular people, the native veterans surmounted any other percentage that other groups had in this country and made a major contribution. So this one is from Lee Windsor. Your honor, have you heard talk in Willistook Way communities about how First World War veterans experiences of being denied pensions and benefits discouraged younger members from participating in later conflicts uh the thing is you see because there was almost like when you're denied benefits from say 19 19 1918 after the war right to world war ii you focus on that but at the time indigenous people were not as well organized politically as we are today and so but it would be just their families in their particular communities that would have known about that but even when that happened still record numbers of indigenous people enlisted for world war ii and later on, even for the Korean, because they believed that they wanted to defend the country, they wanted to defend freedom in the world, even though they themselves and their families were not treated right in the in our indigenous communities. But they sacrificed, and I mean, this was their drive, their contribution to it. And uh, so I commend them. You know, it doesn't hasn't really discouraged that many. I think, like for example, I, I was at an uh, I was at a military event this weekend. Uh, and I was asked, uh, Graydon, uh, well, you can call me Graydon, he said, Honorary Colonel Graydon. <laughs> they got a little bit more respect for Honorary Colonel, they said. And, but I said, uh, why did you agree to be an Honorary Colonel when you know this history about how the uh, military and the government treated your, your people? I said, well, I agreed to be an uh, Honorary Colonel for the 3rd Field Regiment, which is how I'll refer to that as well because I wanted to bring these issues in the forefront. And so more people that know about this, then there'll be better treatment and better respect because one of the things now that's happening in the Canadian uh, forces is we're trying to recruit more and more people to join the military. And so, and this is an opportunity for a lot of our indigenous young people. Well, you start out either in reserve units or you join in regular, regular, services as well and it's a good career path that they can have and one of those you saw in the video about this young woman who is still very active and so um again like i said i guess uh, lee is yes it was known but that did not deter people to volunteer for uh, conflict the same thing happened with the with the when the canadians uh went to um, mid east and and uh, got involved either in iraq or in, in the desert storm as allies. And so they still went because they wanted to do something, something that they could contribute with their life. So I think we always have to, and these are men and women who are doing this, many of them very young, but I think it's a recognition then of how our people want to contribute toward world peace. Uh, a question from Melinda. When the veterans returned from the First World War to their little communities all over New Brunswick, was there any recognition in their own communities of their service, cenotaphs or anything like that? Or was it not part of the cultural consciousness? Well, that's a very good question. You know, like, I mean, like uh, I had other uncles who returned from World War uh, World War II. 
I remember, I mean, I was born in 1946, so I would only remember them later on in, in the 50s. And there, but our, the veterans that Melinda talks about, about Charlie Paul, my, my uncle Herman Salas, and Raymond Trombley, Ray Trombley, and others were involved in uh, promoting athletics. And you know, when, when the Indigenous veterans from, from our community, and there were a lot, came back, they had quite a baseball team. I think I've, I've sent some material to Belinda already. And everybody wanted to play against the Braves from Tubic. But these, but these Indigenous veterans that came back, they were in good physical shape. They were very athletic as well. And they might end up what? I mean, you're supposed to have nine players on the field. Sometimes you'd be lucky if you have 11, nine. So they would be invited to go play senior teams around this particular province. Dalhousie, Camelton, Miramichi, uh, Bathurst, and so they would go, and the transportation was very, very uh, not that good, you know. But they would be. Let I know for sure they went to play in Camelton. They traveled by what vehicle was available was a great big truck. So they went up there, and they would and they would play one game, say like on a Saturday, and then maybe two games on a Sunday. And these other non-Indigenous athletes heard about how good they were, and they were. Believe me, they were very good. And uh, they won their share of games. And uh, one particular pitcher, actually, who was a veteran of World War I and World War II, George Bernard. And uh, George uh, was instrumental in introducing the A movement in our community. But he was a very good pitcher. And they were playing a doubleheader. They just had nine players. So in fact, he had to pitch both games. And we know each game is nine innings. So, and he won both of them. You know, and so that's how uh, that's how athletic he was. And in my mind, I know for sure a lot of these indigenous veterans, very good athletes. Believe me, they could have played major league baseball. It's just they weren't recruited, but they were that athletic. And uh, so they concentrated on guys like me and the younger ones, their sons, to uh, form Little League. And then we end up being champions uh, in, in our particular area. And uh, no, and each of these communities, like in uh, Elsie Buktuk, uh, Madhavanagya, we know it was Red Bank, and the other ones, they also had very good athletes, very good athletes in baseball as well as in hockey. And so they played uh, with the, whatever the major teams were there, and they were just accepted because they were rough and tough. I mean, <laughs> these teams back then, you know, they were, uh, it's a good thing they were referees, but even referees were rough <laughs> and tough. But it, this, but so again, I know for sure that some of our old veterans could have played professional hockey. And I just want to give you one example. There's this guy, he's, he's died now, but he's from Lenox Island. And he was on the uh, playing with the uh, junior Canadians, a farm team for the Montreal Canadians. So he was called up at a training camp that the Montreal Canadians were having. And Duck Harvey, as everybody knows, was a Canadian fan or an HL fan. He was a pretty tough guy. He was a good hockey player. So he decided to tackle this big Charlie Sark from, from, and drove him into the boards. And uh, I mean, Charlie was way bigger than Doug, uh, than Doug Harvey. And then he Charlie turned around and smacked him right in the face and knocked him out. And so uh, he wasn't going to take any guff from him, even though the guy was a veteran. So the management said, you can't do that to our star players. He says, well, he never should have taken me to the boards. And so because of his action, he never made the team. They put him somewhere else. But, uh, but believe me, they, a lot of these people, they were excellent athletes because they were in good shape. We had people who were runners, uh, you know, uh, ran in marathons and excellent, excellent athletes. And, uh, but not much recognition was given to them. So anyway, something we could be in the sports mode. I can talk a lot about indigenous sports, but I'll better <laughs> stop there. Were Indigenous members of the military segregated or were they part of regular units? Second part, were they given equal responsibilities or were they largely given lesser tasks? No, they were soldiers and they were, I mean, they were whatever particular North Shore Regiment or the, the uh, or the Patricia, all these, if, all these different units that ex existed in the army, they were very much a part of that. And uh, like, for example, like when we saw the thing about Oliver Poulter's from Woodstock First Nation, you know, he served until he was wounded and he was brought back. 
uh, like Margaret Labilloa was a regular member in the Air Force. And, there, and when you go across the country, you'll see the different contributions that were made. No, no, they were they were welcomed because they are, I mean, they were they were very brave. And uh, and if you really want to know a little bit more about Mr. Prince, please, you'll see what he was able to do in Italy, and on more than one occasion, to satisfy his particular unit. And uh, again, uh, there are others. Well, you, you heard about the guy's sharpshooter, but there was also not a really sharpshooter that I was hoping to build in this thing, but you know, he's actually from Newfoundland, Eno. This guy was a crack shot. How? Because that's how we used to hunt the seals. Seal comes up, bang, gotta shoot him right away. And so he, this guy was a cracker back or char. I mean, he was a good shot and he didn't waste any bullets. So he acted up actually, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to place people who kill people, but in defense, he, he was very good. And, uh, and there are others across this land, you know, who, who, who very, very valuable service. I mean, you could have, uh, this is why I like the message so much from this first minister and the first minister I've ever heard praise indigenous people. I've never heard any other minister give the kind of speech that she gave which gives then a little bit of pride for people like myself and others of the contribution that our indigenous men and women contributed in the military. So they, no, they were accepted, you know, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and they, they, did, they did what they were trained to do and did it valiantly as well. Many died, but that's what happens in war, no matter how good you are, there's an opportunity you may not come home alive. What was your own military experience? Well, like every high school kid, you start with air cadets, right? And so I was involved in air cadets up in school in Perth Andover area, and there were a number of us. And and it was uh, I, I joined the I joined the air cadets mainly because I mean I was involved in scouts and all that stuff, but air cadets mainly because of my uncle who had served in the. Uh, in World War II and never came home. So I, I a little bit of uh, that in me. And actually when I was graduating from high school, I intended to go to the Royal Military College in Kingston. Although maybe first two years might've been at, at CMR College, Military Royal in Quebec, Saint Jean, Quebec. However, uh, an older brother talked me to go to St. Evex instead. <laughs> and so I forgot, I'd for, I didn't go into the military, however, in uh, after my first year at the University of St. Evex, when I returned in 1965, I in fact joined the what's called the URTP program, which is the reserve unit for the Air Force at the time. And uh, so I went training up in an area called Centralia, Ontario in 1966. I mean, you take your courses in the academic year, right, where you take military history and all that. Uh, all the stuff that you would learn as boot camp, I guess. And uh, so I went to, um, as I said, I, I, when I left Centralia, I was actually stationed at CFP Chatham in 1966. And uh, boy, that was quite, quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite an experience for me at the time, you know? And uh, so and six, when I was gonna, be offered another posting for the summer of 67. Uh, I was offered uh, Summerside PEI, Gagetown, Uplands, and I, and I forget the other one. There, was, there were four, I had a choice of going to these particular bases for the summertime. However, I asked for a posting in, in Germany uh, because I had studied German as language at the university. And the intent of studying German was, in fact, so I could do graduate work in mathematics in Germany, who were very, uh, at the time, very ahead of the kind of mathematics I was interested in. However, because I asked for a posting in Europe, they said no, because there's no guarantee you're going to join the military for four or five years after you graduate, even at graduate school. So they didn't want to invest for me on that one. So uh, I asked for my release from the military and I was given so I could in fact uh, go to Germany the summer of 67 to work two months to learn language. I mean, you learn, you know how to read and write when you're at university, but speaking it is different. So I, I learned that. And then uh, I had a month hitchhiking 
and we went around. That's how I got to visit my uncle's grave in Netherlands, uh, where he's buried. And so after I graduated from uh, Saint of X, I mean, military wasn't on my mind. Uh, and uh, so it was only much later when I was asked to, would I consider uh, offering my name for the honorary colonel of the third field regiment, the loyalist company. And so I thought about that, took a while. My wife and I talked about it quite a bit. And then ultimately I said, yeah, okay, I'll allow my name to stand. And then of course, it's up to the Minister of National Defense and the other political people in Ottawa, they determine whether you would in fact be appointed. So that's, uh, but I'm glad I did. Uh, I've done three years and I'm, I'm supposed to be up for three points. I'm not sure when that'll happen, but, uh, but I, I'm enjoying it because I think um, have an opportunity to give a perspective that's different just just even now, when I talked about last uh, Saturday, I made a uh, presentation to the military officers who were gathered in St. John on residential schools. Many of them had never heard of what happened. So I was given an opportunity to talk to about maybe 200 and just explain to them about uh, the history of residential schools. And so uh, from an indigenous perspective, I guess, <laughs> so they might get it from other ways, but uh, but that was very well received and there was a lot of questions. Anytime you, uh, and I remember this one soldier coming up to me, he, he said, uh, I thought I was well-educated. He says, but I never knew what you shared here because of course, and I told him, who teaches this stuff at university? Who teaches it at high school? Who teaches it anywhere? I said, I do when I teach courses, but I said, uh, so I said, if you need more information based on my PowerPoint presentation, contact me and I'll send you all kinds of stuff. So I think I'm trying to contribute as much as I can in the uh, military environment now. And um, I'm hoping to be more involved in the Black Bear program, which is what the army has uh, to try to recruit the young indigenous uh, uh, young men and young women to join the military. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good summer program actually. And uh, so, but Anyway, I'm hoping to be more involved that way, but time will tell, I guess, but anyway. Thank you for joining us this evening and thank you for the wonderful presentation and answering all the questions and sharing your fabulous stories with us. And <laughs> not long answers at all. Like I said, I could sit here all night and listen to you. And um, if you have any further questions, contact the Fredericton Region Museum by email at fredericktonregionmuseum at gmail.com or call, pick up the phone and call them 506-455-6041. You can check out their website at fredericktonregionmuseum.com or their Facebook page for up-to-date information. And I guess we'll see you all next month. Mm -hmm.